you may think we've been slacking off recently what with our not getting an episode out that first Sunday of January nor the previous Sunday and well that first Sunday was really all about the holidays with us needing a break and then last Sunday is our first real gaffe I'd been gone the entirety of the week which is usually when I'm writing and taking notes and doing some reading when I'm doing a history or just going through several different versions of uh, a folktale I've heard. I got home from being away during the week and I was just really sick and then on top of that Bond and I had another recording project over the weekend which has absolutely nothing to do with Dr. Pennsylvania. That being said, we've recently also had the help of some good friends of ours who've been bringing us books, and in fact, I've even uh, was given a book over the Christmas break by a, a friend I work with about a peculiar incident that occurred in 1950, which I plan to write about and bring an episode forth soon, so I'm not going to mention anything more about that, but thanks again. This week we have something new, because this is a, an episode that neither Bond nor I have written, and it comes from our friend Dan, who's a history teacher and is knee-deep in a graduate program at the moment. One of the things that I really like about this is not only the fact that Dan did all his own research and provided me with notes, but it's also about a place just up the road from where I'm at here in Butler County. A number of years ago, a good friend and I had gotten just really interested in everything that occurred at Love Canal up in New York. and. It's really a story, a lot like Saturday Night Fever, in which there's just no good, decent people in the entirety of the story. And what this story today is about is related to Love Canal and the fact that it pertains to the Superfund. And what is the Superfund? And how does it relate to a little town of less than 600 people up in northeastern Butler County. In 1980, the United States federal government passed the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act of 1980. What most of us probably know, if you know it at all, we know it as the EPA Superfund. This legislation was passed mostly as a response to the environmental disasters at Love Canal up in New York and the Valley of the Drums outside of Louisville, Kentucky. But they weren't the only sites in need of dire help. You may also have heard of like Times Beach. As part of the creation of the Superfund, the Environmental Protection Agency identified sites all across the nation that needed to be addressed immediately by way of something called the National Priorities List, or NPL. One of the very first sites identified by the EPA was a small place up in northwestern Butler County in Bruin Borough, known colloquially as the Bruin Lagoon. Bruin sits about 50 miles north of the city of Pittsburgh on the south branch of Bear Creek, which flows into the Allegheny River just a few miles outside of town. The location, with its abundance of natural resources, made Bruin a small town that was a, actually a thriving industrial town for the better part of the 20th century. It was here in 1930. The Bruin Oil Company first began to dump their waste byproducts into a small lagoon which was held back by an earthen dam. These chemicals again were byproducts of oil refining, including some various acidic supernatant and coal sludge. As the industrial output surrounding the community grew, so did the lagoon, now seen as a catch-all for various industrial byproducts. By 1968, the lagoon was owned by American International Petroleum Company and was filled with some 35,000 yards of asphaltic sludge and an additional 130,000 gallons of various acidic supernatant. I may be pronouncing that word wrong, but that's just on the side. 
It was during this time in the late 60s then that the Brune Lagoon became famous, or rather infamous, when it ruptured, spilling some 3,000 gallons of industrial chemicals into the nearby Bear Creek. The spill itself became famous in the area and nationally was seen as another example of dangerous industrial sites for the growing environmental movement was still pretty nascent as we know it today. The spill itself had dramatic consequences. As previously stated, Bear Creek at the site of Bruin is only about six miles from the Allegheny River which it flows into flowing all the way down to Pittsburgh where it meets with the Monongahela, the confluence of the Allegheny and the Monongahela, you get the Ohio River right in downtown Pittsburgh at the site of Fort Duquesne. The immediate impact was a severe die-off of fish through the entire river system anywhere south of Bruin. Some 4 million fish died uh, between both Bear Creek and the Allegheny River. Fish were being uh, reported as far south as Pittsburgh, about 50 miles again to the south of Bruin. More destructively though, the water systems of huge numbers of communities were forced offline for months in some cases, while the Pennsylvania Department of Forest and Water, the forerunner to the Department of Environmental Protection figured out what exactly was in the water and when it would be safe to drink again. In the following years, the lagoon again switched hands, this time to ARHS Coal Company, which also used it to dispose of various byproduct and waste materials. By 1980, the ARHS Company had gone bankrupt and the Bruin Lagoon was again showing wear and was in danger of failure. And it came to the attention of the EPA as a candidate for the Superfund. It was also in 1980 that the lagoon showed exactly how dangerous it could be when flooding Bear Creek seeped into the lagoon, spreading toxic waste over an area of about 44,000 square feet all around the lagoon. During the first inspection of the lagoon to see if it qualified for Superfund status, the EPA had the following to say, quote, Contaminant migration exists at the Bruin Lagoon Superfund site, groundwater and surface water. Sampling of monitoring wells has confirmed that localized down gradient groundwater contamination has resulted from the site. A single series of surface water samples indicated contamination from the lagoon, most likely from groundwater seepage into Bear Creek. In addition, potential exists for the failure of the dike enclosing the lagoon thereby releasing the lagoon contents into Bear Creek. The site then became one of the first sites to be proposed for inclusion on the national priorities list and officially listed as a Superfund site in 1983. The EPA estimated that, all told, it would take roughly two and a half million dollars to fully clean the site. For many of these Superfund sites, the story would end there. The EPA would typically come in, clean up the area, and then leave again. The Bruin Lagoon, though, was not your typical situation. First, the lagoon itself was a dumping site for a number of different chemicals from a number of different industries and coal production byproducts, uh, chiefly among them. As the cleanup progressed in 1984, the cleanup crews broke through an unidentified crust layer, quote, releasing sulfur dioxide, hydrogen dioxide, and sulfuric acid mist, end quote. While the EPA temporarily stopped the cleanup for these safety concerns, the lagoon itself was still very much in danger and a flood the following year, 1984, threatened to once again release toxic materials into Bear Creek. The cleanup was delayed for another five years while the EPA attempted to figure out just what chemicals exactly were in the lagoon. Ultimately, the EPA wasn't able to actually figure that out for certain and just gave the euphemistic name of sludge. The cleanup 
began again in 1989 and was officially taken off the EPA's national priorities list in 1997, and the lagoon was handed over to the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection for further monitoring. This move, however, was not without incident. The EPA would periodically check in on the site to see if it was still being maintained. In 2007, they had determined that the state hadn't been to the site for six years, and soil samples found that 15 chemicals that weren't detected when the EPA had turned the site over to the DEP had been discovered in the soil near the lagoon. The site was placed on an action program, and it is on track to continue monitoring the site until 2020. Beyond that though, the cleanup ran into issues with, of all groups, the population of the town of Bruin itself. In the original EPA survey, they had a meeting with the citizens of the borough that was described in the original action plan. On February 11, 1982, at a meeting in Bruin, we described each of the remedial alternatives to a group of approximately 115 people consisting of students, contractors, local citizens, and representatives of public interest groups. At the meeting and during the two-week comment period which followed, we received a number of comments regarding the alternatives proposed by Weston. In general, the few comments we received from local citizens indicated little concern regarding the site and on-site remedial alternatives. The citizens of Bruin, it seemed, were not terribly interested in the cleanup efforts of the EPA. After all, they had lived with it for so long. During the time the EPA was actively involved in the cleanup of the lagoon, the residents of Bruin were actually more interested in getting them out of the borough, going so far as to ask the borough solicitor if it was not possible to sue the EPA for damages. Living as close to the Bruin Lagoon as I do, I was surprised, well, and being interested in Superfund sites as I was, like Love Canal, it's not talked about that much over here, and I think a lot of that has everything to do with the fact that the local people were kind of reticent to have the EPA in their backyard. It certainly didn't make the town look good, but also it had been there since before most people were born in the early 1930s. And I was going through some newspapers after receiving these notes from uh, my friend Dan, who picked this story up, and I was going through some uh, an article in the Post-Gazette from November 28, 1988, after the site had been on the Superfund site for a number of years and during the five-year hiatus as the EPA tried to determine again what chemicals exactly were present in the lagoon. One resident who was within a few hundred yards of the lagoon proper said that she grew up there and it's just it's really strange to me. She she says that she's she didn't feel like it had really done anything. Uh it really wasn't causing any problems, never minding the fact that she also states in the record that her childhood dog was shot when it was stuck in the sludge and that several of her sisters had been afflicted with cancer. Another resident said that he didn't really want people to think bad and felt that the two million two point five million dollars would have been better just invested into the town proper regardless the site is considered contained right now and it's still being monitored again for another maybe five years there is still a health risk posed if you are immediately on the site or if flooding will spread the toxins further out but regardless that's the story of the Bruin Lagoon in a nutshell Butler County is fortunate to only have two super fun sites the other being about 25 miles south in the Buffalo Township area it was the site of a former landfill and had some groundwater contamination both sites came on to the EPA's uh, radar right around the same time and both those still being monitored are said to be contained and under control 
So that's the Sunday submission for the last Sunday of January 2016. And again, we need to really thank our friend Dan for stepping forward and really kind of excitedly putting down some notes. And he's going to be doing that in the future periodically as his busy schedule permits. So hopefully that'll kind of bring some new things to the table. If you've got any ideas or want to throw anything out our way or send some notes over, feel free to email us at drpennsylvania at gmail.com.